All right, in this video, we're going to cover some odds and ends with object placement, and we're going to put together a couple prefabs for our ground tiles and for our player uh, so that we can combine our sprites into objects that we'll be able to modify just by modifying the prefab. But before we do that, um, the first thing I wanted to address is the fact that our background is clickable. Now, that might not immediately see, seem problematic, but it would often be the case that you could click on one of these sprites, and when you click on a sprite, it doesn't actually use the information for the sprite's bounding volume. Instead, it clicks through if it's uh, transparent, or if the alpha mask is indicating that that pixel is transparent, meaning that we can easily accidentally select objects that are behind our transparent objects. And there are certain times, or certain objects, certain layers even, that we want to make sure are not easily clickable, because we don't want to accidentally click on something and be able to move it around. Now we still want to be able to move it around, but we want that action to be more explicit. There's a way in Unity to make it so every object on a particular sorting layer will not become selected unless you select it in the hierarchy. To do that, we go up here to a very hidden, tiny little button. Well, it's Unity, that's what happens sometimes. They, they all are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We come up here to layers and we click on that and we'll see a variety of different options. So we can show and hide layers um, and we can lock layers. So up here in our sorting layers, what I want to do is I want to click this really tiny little lock icon on background. And what you'll notice now after I do that is I can no longer click on the background. I can click and drag and everything, but the background does not become selected. Now I can still select it in the hierarchy and move it around after it's selected, but I won't be able to accidentally select it. I also want to give that same treatment to our mountains. So I want to select mountains and I want to select lock so that our mountains have the same behavior. Okay, so let's go ahead and create some prefabs. Um, I'm going to go ahead and delete all of our dirt and all of our grasses, except for one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to this one dirt and this one piece of grass. I'm going to create a new game object, an empty game object, and I'm going to call this dirt grass full. Now this is important. I'm going to select the position of this game object to be 0, 0, 0. Then I'm going to select dirt full and grass 2, and I'm going to parent it to dirt grass full. Then I'm going to now, I now have an object called dirt grass full, which I can duplicate as many times as I want, and it comes with a dirt full and a grass two. But in addition to that, I want to turn it into a prefab so I can easily add these in the future. Another important thing about this is when you create tiles, you should always create them out of prefabs. The reason for that is that there are oftentimes cases where we want to modify some aspect of our tile, and we want it to apply to all tiles of the same type. For example, let's say I added a collider to this. So I want my player to be able to collide with this object. If I had just been duplicating all of my sprites all over the place, I would have to make that change to every single individual object. But by preemptively turning these into prefabs, I'll be able to modify all of those objects just by modifying the prefab instance and applying that change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here to create, and I'm going to say create folder, and I'm going to call it prefabs. And then under that, I'm going to create another folder, and let's call this uh, tiles. Then I'm going to click and drag dirt grass full into tiles. And I now have a dirt grass full prefab that I can instantiate wherever I want. And then I can remove them. Next up, let's talk a little bit about snapping. Unity allows us to snap our objects to an invisible grid. To do that, we go up here to Edit, and we find Snap Settings all the way here at the bottom. If we click on this, we will get our Snap Settings. So we have Move X, Move Y, Move Z, Scale, and Rotation. So these will be the spacing in units for moving these objects. So let's say I go ahead and hit one, 
one on move y and move x and one on move z. Let's keep the scale on 0, 1 and the rotation at 15 for that form of snapping. And let's close out of our snap settings. You'll notice that it doesn't actually affect anything by default. What you have to do is you have to hold down control. So now you'll see that I'm snapping at one unit while holding down control and moving this object. So that's really useful. So now I can select Dirk Grass Full, hit Control D, move it forward, and you'll notice it doesn't quite align perfectly. Now the reason why it doesn't align perfectly has to do with the math behind the snap settings as a setting inside of our sprite imports that determine the pixels to units. So we'll see that our Texture Atlas main has a pixel to units of 100. So that's going to be the generated mesh scale of this. So every pixel is going to be 100 units. So with some math, um, I'm not going to go, you, you can, you guys can read about the snap settings. I don't, they're not that great, but they do kind of definitely sort of help most of the time. So I just wanted to point it out real fast and then, um, well, I don't want to worry about it again. Um, I'm just going to do it at point 3. And if you work out the math, that will work out to allow us to snap these particular size tiles um, and have them tile almost perfectly. Maybe it could have been something like... Um, Point three seven was it? Something like that. And of course, since today I can't math, <laughs> let's go to snap settings. We, <laughs> wow, I, I can't believe this flew over my head uh, a, a couple seconds ago. But the the math here is that since uh, our pixel or our, our our tiles are going to be a power of two. Let's go ahead and make our, our power of two divided by a hundred. Let's because that's our pixels to units. Let's go ahead and make this a power of two divided by a hundred. So like 0 0.32 or even 0 0.64. Uh, 0 0.64 should work pretty good with these tiles. So I'm going to delete two of these guys. I'm going to grab this, hold down Control, and you'll see we get an almost perfect snapping. Hold down Control again. And yeah, so now we can sit here and control D and grab all of these guys, control D, and we now have uh, grass with a tiled background. So that looks good. Uh, if you zoom in, you'll see a small pixel of an error, but that's OK. OK, so now that we have um, our dirt grass full. Let's create a couple other prefabs. So I'm actually going to delete all of these because um, now they're so easy to create. I don't really care. Um, my trees. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let's go ahead and prefabify my trees. I'm going to set it scale to one one one. The reason I want to prefabify them is so that I can modify their sorting order just by editing one object as opposed to editing all of them. So I'll add tree. Um, I guess I'll add it. It isn't technically a tile, but I'll add it to the tiles folder. Then I'll delete the other two trees. Okay, so now we have our trees. We have our dirt grass full. Um, let's go ahead and um, I'm going to duplicate our dirt grass full so that we get our um, our things like our uh, sorting order set appropriately. But then I'm going to delete grass two, and you'll notice that breaks the prefab instance. And I'm going to call this dirt full. <laughs> dirtful. Anyway, <laughs> and then I'm going to prefab. Very dirtful of you. Yeah, it's very dirtful of me. I'm going to go ahead and prefabify it by um, dragging it from hierarchy over into tiles. So again, because I've done that, I can now drag out a dirtful or a dirt grassful in a, as one unit. Now that we have our dirtful, let's go ahead and um, I'm going to come here. I'm going to create an empty game object. And I'm going to call it um, dirt mid, and I'm going to place that zero zero zero. 
come down here to dirt mid, drag it out. I'm going to place the dirt mid at 0, 0, 0, so they're both at 0, 0, 0. It might be difficult to see, but it is right there, as you can see. I'm going to parent them, so dirt mid is a child of dirt mid. And then I'm going to prefabify it as dirt mid. Um, wait a sec, I forgot to... Uh, Steve, you let me forget the starting order. Oh, I did. <laughs> right. I blame me completely. You should. Um, let's set the sorting order to foreground. Come back here to dirt mid. Pull that out. Turn it into a prefab. Now we have dirt mid. Let's create our uh, dirt mid grass, our dirt grass mid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select dirt mid. I'm going to say game object break prefab instance so it's no longer related to that prefab. Then I'm going to pull out a grass 2 and I'm going to place it at 0 and then for the y-axis I'm going to place it right about there. And then I'm going to parent it to dirt mid and I'm going to set its sorting layer to foreground. Then I'm going to take dirt mid and I'm going to turn it into a prefab. So now I have dirt full, dirt grass full, dirt mid. Uh, this is going to be called dirt grass mid, so go ahead and rename the prefab. Then I'm going to uh, remove it from my scene. So now we have our dirt full, dirt grass full, dirt mid, dirt grass mid. Uh, let's do our dirt. Uh, this is also our platform as well. So we'll have dirt. Uh, I'll set the layer to foreground. Um, just to follow along with the convention that we have with our other prefabs, I'm going to create an empty game object. Place it at 0, 0, 0. I'm going to rename it dirt. Come up here, parent it. Then I'm going to prefabify it. I love the word prefabify. Well, I mean, I don't know if anybody else uses that word, but it makes complete sense, you know? It, it does. Well, and it's not like you made up a letter. Yeah. That would be weird. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm going to come up here. I'm going to say uh, break prefab instance so that this is no longer related to that. I'm going to bring in a, gra a grass 2. I'm going to set the grass 2's position to 0. And then I'm going to set its Y value to something like that. Then I'm going to parent grass 2 to dirt. I'm going to rename dirt to dirt grass. And then I'm going to prefabify it. Okay, so we now have our tree, dirt mid, dirt grass mid, dirt grass full, dirt grass, dirt full, dirt. So I think that's all we really need for dirt. Um, let's go ahead and do the, that on our punji sticks. So I'm going to go ahead and say 0, 0, 0. I'm going to have this name punji sticks, and I'm just going to turn it to a prefab. The reason I'm turning punji sticks into a prefab, by the way, is that in the future, we're actually going to be adding scripts to our punji scripts, or punji sticks, uh, scripts that result in a player death. Now, what I want to happen, though, is I want to be able to build my level without knowing exactly all the functionality I'm going to be placing on my objects. So that's why I create prefabs, so that when I do go in to actually add that functionality in, I just have to apply that script to this prefab, and it'll be applied to all of my objects of that type. So it makes it very convenient. Uh, I'm not going to worry about prefabifying our mountains. Um, because our mountains are mostly going to be constructed by just control D, and that might be a little bit of waste of space. But anyway. Now, would, would that matter with a prefab if you wanted to parallax the mountains? Um, no. When we go to parallax, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be adding all of these to like a parent object, and then that one parent object will have a script to it. Ah, okay. And this, I mean, this is really pretty simple as far as prefabs go. If uh, you're over at 3D Buzz and joining us in the MMO training class, uh, you would get to see that taken to the next level with 3D objects and what you can do. But this is a really good primer for why you want to have prefabs. Yeah, I mean, prefabs are an incredibly powerful concept in Unity, and there's a lot of different ways to take advantage of them. Some of them we'll see in this series, but um, there are definitely a lot of more advanced scenarios uh, that we can uh, use them in to make some really cool things happen. But um, 
I have to reorder this because it doesn't make any sense because if you assume the level start is on the left hand side that would be kind of an unfair level <laughs> what come on we can't just kill him yeah I'm gonna have some... I could make a little scream that comes up and says ha 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 you you, you started playing the game now you're punished <laughs> Okay, so now we have a, a really basic little level here. Um, let's go ahead and uh, create the player and turn him into a prefab, and I think that'll about wrap everything up. So right. let's go ahead and go to Game Object, Create Empty. I'm going to position him at 0, 0, 0, Remember, always build your prefabs at the origin. If you don't build your prefabs at the origin, your pivots, you, there's a big chance that you will result in having some pivot points that don't make any sense. So make sure that you're at the origin when you're building your prefab. Um, because of that, I'm going to move the camera out of the way so that I can see my origin more clearly. I'm going to call this game object player. Now, the reason I want to create a prefab out of a player, by the way, because you guys might be thinking, well, there'll only ever be one player on the, on the map at a time, and that's true. But when we create another, another level, we'll have another level with another player object. And we want to be able to have those synced up so that if we make changes to one player, on every other scene that he's used, those changes will still be present. Yeah, I mean, when you're when you're playing the game, it looks like your player jumps into a new level. But in actuality, we're destroying all the old stuff and creating a new player with the new level. Exactly. And it also gives us the opportunity to make players, like their controllers or whatever, slightly different on a per scene basis, which is kind of cool too. But All right, let's go ahead and create our talented ball. Let's bring in our body. That is a really, really big body. That is. Uh, let's, uh, let's make him a little smaller. Uh, then let's go ahead and place him at zero, zero, zero. Now, I definitely want the player to be placed at 0, 0, 0, and you'll see that that puts his body in the center of our prefab. Then I'm going to take body, and I'm going to parent it to player. So now when we move around player, we move around body. Next up, uh, let's put on our left eye, which is also very big. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to not scale it just yet. I'm going to keep it at the really, really, really big scale. And then we can scale the whole thing, right? Yep. Okay, so that's going to be our player. Uh, let's bring in our left eye and our right eye. Um, I think that's backwards. All right. There you go. Is that good, Steve? I'm not. See, as you guys can tell, I'm not an artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, take both of those and rotate them counterclockwise just a little so that their curve kind of matches the curve of the ball, body ball. There we go. Alrighty. Um, I am also going to, uh, we'll worry about this in a second, but I will be creating a layer for my player um, so that everything looks good. Um, let's put in the left eye white. And then the right eye white. And some people might be wondering why we tore. Yeah, yeah those are backwards. Um, why we tore our player apart like this? And that's going to come down to the way we're going to animate him layer later. And basically, um, did his eyes need to be torn all apart? Not necessarily. You may not want to do that. But if you do want to create some animations where he looks surprised or something like that, then you're going to need that. You're going to need those broken up like that, so that you've got a little more control of what you're doing as an animator. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this gives us this will give us a lot of flexibility for um, allowing the player to interact with the world, especially. And I can't believe that I got so far into piecing together the player without actually even mentioning why we're doing this in the first place, so good catch, Steve. <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely want these to be individual parts so that we can later, well, animate them and make it interact with the world and maybe have him walk faster when he's moving faster or flail if he's falling or something like that. And we definitely, in order to do that, 
these objects need to be separate. All right, so you'll notice I have a slight ordering problem with my feet here. Uh, we're going to be fixing that when I get to um, ordering the layers, but we'll do that after we're done piecing the player together. Let's go ahead and put in his right hand. Where are his hands supposed to go? Well, again, th those are loose so that you can do whatever you want. Um, his left hand would actually be the furthest thing back in your layer stack once we get that far, because that might be hidden by his body. Okay, so yeah, we'll just place this right here, and then we'll have his right hand be like right about there. Look good? Sure. All right. Um, I th he has wonderful floating body parts, so we can do whatever <laughs> we want. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, I think that pretty much puts the guy together. Uh, let's go ahead and take all of these objects and parent them to the player object. And then let's scale all of these objects down. Whoa. Uh, yeah, let's not do that. All right, let's scale all those objects down, and then let's place him right in the center of the world. Yeah, I got to tell you guys, uh, Nelson and I are about 700 miles away from each other recording this, so I get a somewhat slower frame rate. I don't even know what you just did there, Nelson, but on my screen, it just exploded in white. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I scaled improperly. Um, what I should have done is, uh, to scale by the way, I just selected all these objects and then I just clicked uh, or used the little right hand handle to scale proportionally up and down. But um, that should be good. We can scale them up or down later as needed. So let's go ahead and figure out his ordering. I'm going to come up here to layers. I'm going to say edit layers. So that's the layers button up, up top hit edit layers, I'm going to open up sorting layers, and then yeah, I'm, I'm going to add a separate layer for the player. So let's go ahead and add a new sorting layer for the player. Now that I've added that layer, I'm going to shift click down on every single one of these objects and tell it to go into the player sorting layer. Of course that makes no difference yet. What will make a difference is my order in layer. So let's go ahead and start with his left hand. And let's set his order and layer to, how about negative three? So now his left hand is behind. Um, you might see his left hand if he jumps or if he runs or something like that. Then let's go into his left foot and set his left foot to negative three. Now the reason I'm doing negative three is just to give me some extra uh, integers to play with if I ever wanted something kind of in between those different states. Yeah, because you could rebuild this and have your artist add an entirely different piece that wasn't there. So. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice that the sorting layer here is zero, even though the foot is appearing above the body. That's because in the inspector, it appears above the body. Or it was added after the body was added. So let's go ahead and codify the uh, right foot being above the body by setting its order and layer to three. And let's do the same thing with its right hand. So that way there's no ambiguity and under no circumstances should the body be above the hand or the foot. Okay, so that's the player. Now that he's turned into an object, I can place him and see how he looks in the game. Now that he's created, let's go ahead and uh, prefabify him. So I'm just going to click drag all the way into projects and drop him right down into prefabs. Um, unless I missed it, Nelson, did you order his eyes? Uh, yeah, I broke something. Um, yeah, okay, so we need our um, left eye to have an order and layer of one. Good catch. You can tell that I'm not an artist, like I didn't even realize his eyes disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's do right eye, layer one. He looks kind of demonic right now. Uh, let's set his left eye white to three, and his right eye white to three. And then since we modified the prefab, let's click back on player and hit apply so that all of his changes would be applied to any other player prefab. So now we can see we can drag out as many of these players as we want, even though they are fairly complex objects. Um, it seems we do have 
a sorting error problem. And that's because on my punji sticks, I forgot to set them um, to have a sorting layer of foreground. So make sure you select your punji sticks, make it have a sorting layer of foreground, and then hit apply. So that's now applied on the prefab. Now if I were to select my player, he appears above the punji sticks. Perfect. All right. Now we got it going on. Yep. So let's go ahead and do one last thing. I'm going to hit Control S and save out our scene. I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it Scenes. And then I'm going to call this Level 1 and hit Enter. And we now have a very basic scene using Unity's sprite functionality and prefabs to construct a level out of a handful of texture atlases. Now we get to go into the even more exciting stuff. Yep, next up we're going to be taking a look at moving platforms, so that'll be lots of fun. Anyway, see you guys in the next video.